Okay, good morning, everybody. So today we're going to move on to the next section, and it's kind of it's kind of like a weird side stop about how to expand polynomials. It, it's it's weird. I, when I saw it, I'm like, oh, that's interesting that they put this in this section. Um, it is very useful though. So we'll talk about like it's called something called Pascal's Triangle and Binomial Theorem. It sounds fancy, and it kind of is. We'll practice it a little bit. It's gonna be cool. Once you get the gist of it, you'll like it. But before we do that, of course, we're gonna warm up and review some long division from last time. So let's do that. Perform the following divisions is what we're saying today. Number one says x cubed plus eight divided by x plus two. So you go ahead and set up the little bar thing, just like in you know elementary school things. And the top goes on the inside of the bars and the bottom goes on the outside. Now I strongly encourage you again, if there are missing terms, like this top one has no squares, has no linears, it's just a cube, but no square or anything like that. Maybe put some placeholders. You know, if you got an x cubed, then write, you have a zero x squared and a zero x, write some zero placeholders for things that are missing. Very good idea in practice. The x plus two doesn't have anything missing and there's no higher terms there. So we'll just write x plus two. And then you dive in with the long division. Everything will line up nice if you put some zero placeholders, it's gonna be good. And again, one more time, what the strategy is, is you pick up here, whatever, you just look at the leading people, right? Look at the leading terms. X is the leading one of this. For this whole thing, the leading one's X cubed. And you ask yourself, X times what is X cubed? And the answer would therefore be X squared. So you put yourself an X squared up there. Whatever you choose to put up here, you multiply it by this entire expression. So X squared times X plus two is, well, X squared times X is X cubed. And X squared times two is two X squared. You multiply by the whole thing, and then you need, just like old school long division, you subtract whatever you got from whatever you're working with. So the zero placeholders are great here, so you don't confuse yourself. So the x cubes are gone. You got zero minus two, that's negative two. So you got negative two x squared left over after that. And then in the end, if there's anything over here, like just like old school long division, if there's anything you haven't dealt with, bring it down. And then you start all over again. So then you say, okay, x times what is this leading thing, which is negative two x squared. Well, x times just negative two x would be negative two x squared. And again, whatever you pick up here, you multiply by this whole thing. So negative two x times x is negative two x squared. Negative two x times two is negative four x. Put some parentheses, put a big minus sign out in front. Remember you're gonna subtract this whole darn thing. Watch your minus negatives and stuff like that. That's the little things I always guess. The first thing should always cancel out if you picked up here correctly. That's the whole point. These two should match. They go away. You got zero X is minus negative four X is at zero plus four X, which is just four X. So you have a four X left over after that subtraction. And we're getting, we're getting closer and closer and closer. This is eight on the end that we haven't dealt with. So we bring down the eight and we go one more time. And then we ask ourselves, okay, can I do X times something being four X? Yes, I can. That'd be a four. And then when you choose the four and multiply by this entire expression here, four times X plus two is four X plus eight. Well, that's nice. It's the exact same thing. So when you subtract it this time, you have a zero remainder. So you're all done. Your final answer is X cubed plus eight divided by X plus two is just your answer, which was X squared minus two X plus four. So there's our answer. No remainder, no need to write plus you know, zero or anything. That's silly, so done with that. That's it. Number two, same kind of thing. It's actually easier. It's going to take less time. Let's see if we can do this. So you got an x squared on this one. The smaller the degrees you're working with, the less time it will work. So a squared, it's going to take a lot less time than like a cubic or a fourth degree or something like that. So you got x squared plus three x plus two divided by x plus one. And you ask yourself again, just looking at the leading people, x times what is x squared? Will that just be x? So when x goes up top, and x times the whole x plus one is x squared plus x. When you multiply it by that entire expression. And then you subtract, of course, right? x squared go away. 3x minus x is 2x. So you got a 2x left over after subtraction. There's a 2 on the end that has just come along for the ride. So bring that down. And then we'll go one more time. Yes, x times something is 2x. x times two is, so we put a plus two up top. And the two times the entire x plus one, well, two times x is two x, two times one is two. And you subtract them, you get a big old zero. So again, this one worked out nice and clean. x squared plus three x plus two divided by x plus one is just x plus two. And we're all done with that.
In fact, what you hear, what's going on in this one, if you look at it differently, is could you factor the top? Forget this division problem altogether. What's on top here? Could you factor that? Can you think of two numbers multiplied by two and add to be one? Or excuse me, multiply by two and add to be three? Two and one, yeah. So if you factor the top, look what's on top and on bottom. There's an x plus one, right? And they would have canceled out, and then you could, would have been the same as x plus two. So buried inside this thing was just secretly x plus two. Could have factored it to figure it out. Could have done long division to figure it out. But we're good on that. All right, last one today, number three, is just very much a conceptual kind of question. It's asking, what's the relationship between the degree of the dividend, the divisor, and the quotient in any polynomial division exercise? Well, what do those terms even mean? So if I want to write down this little cheat sheet here, I forgot those. I remember when I was a kid, I didn't remember what those terms meant. Like somebody told me when I was 16, oh, what's the divisor? I'd be like, what the heck are you talking about? I don't know what a divisor is. But as a refresher, the divisor is what you're dividing by. That's what I remember. Like, okay, I'm dividing by this thing. That's the divisor. The dividend is what you were actually dividing. And the quotient is what you get out for your answer. In case you haven't noticed, we'll see what's going on here. Hmm. Is there a pattern in these exponents that are involved? Well, let's go back to number one real quick. If you look at number one on the board real quick, you had a third degree up here, correct? You divided by a first degree, right? And you got at a second degree. So three minus one is two. A third degree divided by a first degree is a second degree. For number two, you had a second degree divided by a first degree. Well, two minus one is one, right? So the general pattern here is in general, if you take the power of the dividend, the thing on top, that's one of the thing right there. If you take the power of the dividend minus the power of the divisor, what you're dividing by. So if you take the exponent on top and you divide it by the exponent on bottom, basically you subtract them. So if you take the exponent on top, divide minus the exponent on bottom, you get the exponent of your answer. So that'd be the power of your quotient, your answer, right? Now you don't need to write out things formally like that or think in terms of divisor and dividend. You don't have to do any of that junk, but it's just good to think. Hey, if I got a cubic and I'm dividing by a first degree, three minus one will be two, I expect to get a second degree out. If I have a 50th degree polynomial and dividing by a 22nd degree polynomial, 50 minus 22 would be 28. I expect to get a 28th degree polynomial out there as well. All right, LGs today. Interesting topic. It's cool, actually. Pascal's triangle, so something called the binomial theorem. I know, That'd be great. This is something usually not thrown in most curricula until pre-calc. Reveal has chosen to put it in your guys. It's good for you, actually. Save you so much time. There you go. It will save you a lot of time. It's a little shortcut to do what you guys want to do when you kill that puppy. When you distribute those powers, you can't do that, but there is a formula to expand out like three plus two cubed or the expression five X plus Y to the fifth power. Is there a way to actually expand that out? Yes, there is. Taking it's a little tricky though. So I'm gonna throw a whole bunch of weird words at you in terms right off the bat. You're gonna write them down blindly, not quite understand what we're talking about. And then actually when we use some examples, it'll all start coming together and making some sense. So have some patience on this one. Expect a little bit of a struggle right off the bat. Okay, homework 4.4 is due today. If you're doing that on paper, get that turned into the tray, or of course you can do it online, that's fine too. There's a new one, 4.5, make sure you jot that down. It's not that many problems, but I want you to go nice and slow and make sure you get this concept down because they are a little bit tricky. Page 251, one through six and nine through 16. I took out anything that had to do with word problems or applying it to anything. Do Wednesday, of course. All right, notes. Notes, 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 heavy notes today. Section 4.5, here we go. Title today, powers of binomials. If you like to write down titles, that's what it is. I'll at least write down the section, section 4.5. We're doing section 4.5. Powers of binomials. All right. Preliminary stuff. Uh, let's see what we might need to write down, what not. Hmm, let's see. How about this? Let's see. Uh, uh, let's just kind of go to the board real quick. I'm going to go off script on this one for just a second. 
uh, powers of binomials. Let's just think real quick where they're headed with this thing. Okay, I'm going to ask you to do this. Here's what we're trying to do today. We're trying to take two things added or subtracted together inside of a parenthesis and raise that whole thing to a power, maybe two. Now, what I yell at you about is what can you not do? You cannot just square this and square that. Don't do that. That's, that's like the number one thing people do in math, and it just ruins your life. Don't do that. What's it mean to square something? You have to multiply it by itself. That's what squaring anything means, right? Four squared, four times four, nine squared, nine times nine. X plus one squared, X plus one times X plus, four, X plus one. Which means you got to do what? Distribute it out, right? And if you did, I'll save you the time of doing it with like terms. You get something like this. Now, I want you to look at the numbers involved in here. There is a one, a two, and a one. There's, there is a pattern to this. No matter what you do, if you had an X plus something squared, there'd be something that has a one, a two, and a one in it. I'll save you the time on this one. If you took X plus one cubed, what does that mean? It means it multiplied by itself. Three times, right? Which would be horrible. Because what do you guys have to do? And what do you have to do up to this point? You have to multiply two of them together, correct? Pain in the butt, clean it up, and then multiply that by the other one, right? And if you'd done that, it would have turned into some other kind of thing. If you clean up all the like terms, it would have been something like that looks like this. But there's a pattern in this one, too. One, three, three, one. There's this pattern. There are patterns that are going to keep coming up no matter what you do. And to illustrate what that pattern is, there is something called Pascal's triangle. And I would like you to take a second and jot down this little triangle right here. It's a weird looking thing. I know it's weird. I'll show you where it comes from in a minute, but that's where all these numbers are gonna come from today. One, two, one, in my first example, one, two, one. You see there's a row in your triangle that says one, two, one. My next example had a one, three, three, one as the numbers in front of your variables. If you look in your Pascal's triangle, there's a one, three, three, one. Then there's a row up to that says one, four, six, four, one. And there's a row after that that says one, five, 10, 10, five, one. This is something I, you would want to have by you and you would, I would give it to you on the test because I don't expect you to memorize a whole bunch of numbers. I'll show you where they come from though. If you're really in a jam on a desert island, you could figure these out. You might notice there's a pattern in them, at least somewhat. On the outside, as you go down the triangle, they're always ones. And this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the last slide that I kind of glossed over real quick was really saying some of the characteristics that you can visually see inside this triangle. It's symmetric across the middle. The stuff on the left is the mirror image of the stuff on the right. And if you know these numbers and you know the trick that we're going to talk about today called the binomial theorem, then that allows you to expand anything like x plus 5 or 6x minus 3y or whatever raised to some power very, very quickly. So there's Pascal's triangle. Where does it come from? It's actually very easy. Let me show you where it comes from real quick in case you need to do it on your own someday. First off, just start with some ones. Okay, triangle. So we start with the first row, and then the second row has two, the third row is going to have three, the fourth row is going to have four, etc. To figure out, first of all, what always goes on the outsides are ones. And if you need to find something in between them, you take the ones above it. This is the trick. You take the ones above it and you add them together. What's one plus one? Two. So what goes right in between the one plus one is a two. And then you keep going with this pattern. Okay, well, there's always ones on the outside, correct? Here's a one and a two. What do they add to be? Three, here's a two and a one. What do they add to be? Three, and then there's a one on the outside. And you keep going with this. One on the outside, right? Okay. One plus three is four, right? Three plus three is six, and three plus one is four. Then there's a one on the outside. And you can see that the triangle is starting to be developed right here, correct? So if you really needed to, all this, is, all this triangle does is take the two above it, put them together, and shove it into something else like this. One thing I definitely want you to write down are some tricks about how to use this triangle right here. So take a minute and jot down my little box here before I proceed because my box is really starting to say some things you might want to consider when we're going to use this. Like, where's this going? What's this guy talking about? First thing I want to say is, this is kind of weird for you guys. When you're counting rows and columns, you actually don't want to start counting like the traditional way. Oh, one two, three. You would like to start counting them at zero. This does include something raised to the zero power, 
What's anything raised to the zero power, guys? You guys know anything to the zero power is just, nope, it's just one. And if you look at the very top of your pyramid, there's just a lone one. That stands for something raised to the zero power. And again, right now, this is all just kind of just some hodgepodge of weird ideas thrown at you. And it'll all come glued together in the end when we start to apply this stuff to actually doing it. So when you count these, make sure you're starting with zero. The top row is row zero. The second row is row one. The third row is row two and so on and so forth. This, that's called zero index. Not everything with counting in the universe, especially with computer programming, things like that, they like to throw in counting starting with zero. So you have to remember that when you're dealing with this, don't start counting with one, start counting with zero. When you're expanding something out, the exponent, say you had x plus five to the seventh power, the seven is the power, that tells you what row you're looking at. The row, the seventh row, by the way, row seven is the one that has the seven starting with it. So it's the very bottom one there. There's no tricks on that. Row five is the one with the one five in it. The row six is the one with the one six in it. So basically, if you're raising something to the seventh power, you'll go look at the row that starts with a seven. If you're some raising to some fourth power, you'll look at the one four six four one row because that starts with a four right there. Please write down the bottom thing. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, it's never a math question. It's always a bathroom question, every single time. <sighs> They're about to throw a weird formula at you. It's going to look really funky. It's going to be scary at first. You're going to be like, what the heck is this thing? This is really actually not bad. But the formula's got this thing in it, this NCK thing on the end. Please write down that term. What that stands for, this NCK thing stands for the entry in this triangle that's in the nth row and the kth column. Rows are how deep you go down, columns are how far you go left to right kind of stuff. So NCK is what that's gonna be denoted as. And before we go on any further, we should practice just figuring out what these kind of things are. So here's some examples for you real quick, okay? Let's say somebody goes to says 5C3. What is 5C3? That means row or row five, okay, column, Three. Now, where is row five? Is this row? Is this row one? No, this is row zero, right? So row zero, um, one, two, three, four, and then if I'd gone down one more, I'd be down here. This would be row five. Fair enough. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. Or another way is what? You just look for the one that starts with a five. Cool. What's the third entry in this row? This just tells you which one you're in. This is not the first one. Again, they start with zero, right? So this is zero, one, two, three. So this one right here, okay? 5C3 represents that number in my little triangle right here. So if somebody said, oh, what's 5C3? You would say it's equal to 10. Cool. Let's say some other dude said uh, 3C2. Then you're looking for row three, right? Third one down. Second thing over, but of course start with zero, right? So three, let's see here, zero, right? One, two, three, here's our row. This is what we're gonna concentrate on. And of course it starts with the three, right? That's another way to look at it. The second entry is not this one, because it starts with zero, right? So this is zero, one, two, right here. So three C2 would represent this number in my triangle, which would just be number three right there. And we'll do one more for good measure. Let's say they gave you uh, four C4. Well, that would be row four, fourth one down, fourth one over. So let's see what the fourth one down is. It'll start with one, just make sure it starts with zero. Zero, one, two, three, four. Starts with a four, right? Makes sense. And the fourth entry, zero, one, two, three, four, is one right here, okay? So that would be a one. So that's what that C stuff means, okay? And technically, if you wanna know what that's called, it's called a 
combination. It's a statistics thing. I am not going to go into that with you. We, we got enough to do today. We're not going to go into that. Don't worry. But that's what it's called. It's, it's got the C thing because it's called a combination, something like that. Now, what the heck am I doing? See, I'm just talking about triangles all day and like weird patterns. What's the point of this? This has all been leading up to this bottom thing here on this slide. Take a minute and jot it down. That still probably looks scary as heck to you. That's okay. I'll show you. It's actually not as bad as it looks. It's just some sigma notation, which you don't know. And some. Times have changed. Something called this binomial theorem. It's up here too. I would really just copy down the bottom one there. Even though it doesn't make sense to you, I will show you some examples. And it'll make a lot more sense. It's not nearly as scary as it looks, but you have to get the gist of it. The only thing you need to do to use that scary formula is understand a couple of basic concepts. Number one, you're going to be using these rows in this triangle. That's the main thing you have to understand. You're going to be using these numbers to solve problems. To expand binomials. The whole point is you have something like a plus b raised to some power. And you cannot do the a to the power plus the b to the power, not allowed. But you can expand out with this very complicated formula right here. Looks very scary because it is. All right. Okay. Let's actually try to use this. What, what, what is all this? Let's put it all together. We had a lot of talk about weird stuff. Here we go. All right. Example number one. I'm just going to show you because it's just something that you have to have seen done. Okay. Take a second and jot down this example number one. Okay. Just this x plus y to the seventh. Just write that down x plus y to the seventh. What Pascal's triangle does for you is it allows you to go ahead and simplify all this stuff. And we can expand this thing out without writing x plus y times itself seven times. We can use these numbers to figure out what's going to happen. Here's how you do it. Ready? First off, what power is this raised to, guys? Seven. So can you go find row seven for me? That's the first thing you do is you go find row seven. Where is row seven? It is right here. Would you agree? Don't forget you're starting by zeros, right? So if you didn't know that, you could just say, okay, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're here. Cool. Now, that tells me for this problem, I'm going to be using all the numbers in this row. That's all it means, okay? And here's how you start off with. You go through the numbers one by one. The first one is one, correct? Write one. And what you, comes after that is one of the variables or one of the things inside of here is raised to the seventh power, okay? And the other one's raised to the zero. Here's, what, here's the pattern, ready? One's going to start high, seven's high, right? The other one's going to start low at zero. And as I go down this line, you're going to see this. One of them's going to get smaller, the other one's going to get bigger. They're going to kind of slowly flip flop. You're going to see as we go. Here we go. X to the seventh, Y to the zero. You're going to see the pattern in just a second. Doesn't matter which one you do, but one of them starts at the highest, seven. The other one starts at the lowest of zero. You add on and you go down this list. What's the next thing in the row? Seven, right? So you add on seven times. Now here's the deal. Like I said, one, they're going to flip flop, okay? What was x raised to the seventh rate? Bring it down one. Now it's raised to the sixth. But when that one goes down, the other one goes up. So this is y to the zero, correct? So now it's y to the first. So there's the next entry in expanding this thing out. The next part's going to be, keep going down the line, one, seven. The next one's going to be 21. So if you add plus 21, and then that's times, guess what x is raised to now? And the guess is what x is raised to? To the fifth, yep. Mm -hmm. And y is raised to the? You got it. That's the whole concept behind those exponents right there. And you just keep doing this. The next number is 35, right? So we write plus 35. And then it'd be x to the fourth and y to the third. The x went down one and the y went up one. Next, another 35, right? So plus 35. Now the x is only raised to the third and the y is up to the fourth. They just keep flip-flopping as you go. One's going down, just be consistent. 
whichever one's going down, have it keep going down, whichever one's going up, have it keep going up. And then plus 21x to the second, y to the fifth. We're getting there, we're getting there. And then you got a seven, so plus seven, just x to the first, or just x, right? And then y to the sixth. And then lastly, on the end, you got a one, so plus one. Now the x is not raised to the first, it's raised to the zero. I'll even put the one there just to show the pattern. And the y is finally up to the seventh power. So if you had taken the time to do x plus y times x plus y times x plus y, seven of them, and taken the time to distribute all that out, which would take you an hour probably, you would eventually turn into something that looks like this right here. Now let's clean it up a little bit, okay? First things first, I'm just illustrating this with numbers. Do you ever want to write one times something? Probably not, right? One's pointless. And what's anything to the zero power? It's just one. In fact, you might want to write that down if you don't know that. Any number to the zero power, no matter what it is, is equal to one. And that will come up here because there's things raised to zero powers. Here's a y to the zero. That's just one then, right? So I got a one, a one. Really, this is just an x to the seventh. So I'm just cleaning now, OK? I already wrote down the pattern. I'm just going to clean it up a little bit. Why write one x to the seventh, y to the zero, and I can just write x to the seventh? A lot of these don't have any cleaning to do. This one's just 7x to the sixth, y. You don't need to write things to the first power correct. You don't need to write with the dot either. I'm just kind of recopying things now. 21x to the fifth, y squared, 35x to the fourth, y cubed, 35x cubed, y to the fourth. So I'm not doing anything too special right here. I'm just recopying. First powers, you don't need to write first powers. Just write them as the variable. And then the last term, when you're recopying that, same kind of thing. It's got a one. No reason to write one times something correct. X to the zero is one also, right? So you got a one times a one, which is just one times y to the seventh, so y to the seventh. That's what this whole triangle is good for, honestly. You break through all the talky talk from the lesson. Essentially, if you have something raised to a power, you go find that row, okay? And this will tell you the numbers in front of all the stuff as you expand them out. One's going to start high, one's going to start low, and they're going to flip off as you go. That's the concept. So let's try another one real quick. And uh, let's see here. How about can't do enough of these. They do take some practice. Here's a check for you real quick. It says mm, C plus D to the fourth. Take a second, write that one down. C plus D raised to the fourth. Okay, so if you're doing C plus D, or it did, you know, it doesn't always have to be letters too. It could be numbers, it could be anything. You gotta be careful with the numbers too. C plus D to the fourth. Okay, what do you do? You go find row four. That's whatever the exponent is, that's what row I'm looking at. And what I've been thinking about is this one right here, because that's the one with the four in it, right? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna start with a one times something, right? It doesn't matter which one you do, one's gonna start high. How high can it go? Up to the exponent four. Then we're gonna start low at zero. And they're going to flip-flop as we go. Which one do you want to start high? It doesn't really matter. C or D. Which one do you want to start high? Let's have C start high. Okay, okay. here we go. Fourth row, right here. One. Start off with one. So I write one times C is going to start high, so C to the fourth. And that means the other one, D, has to start low, so D to the zero. What number comes next, then? Four comes next. Yeah, so plus four. And then the C's exponent is the one going down, and the D's is the one going up. So C cubed times D. Moving right along, you just keep it to the next number. Don't forget your numbers. Kids get so excited sometimes they forget the numbers. Six is next, right? So plus six. And now the C is going down, so C squared, and the D is going up, so D squared. And you proceed with this as you go. After the six comes another four in a triangle, so plus four. C is down to one, D is up to three. And lastly, one, so you have a one times, now C is down to zero as the exponent, and D is all the way up to four. So I've kind of switched roles by the time we get there. That's pretty darn good, except for the, you know, I'm writing ones and something to the zeros. You know, in practice, when you get good at this, of course, you probably won't write one times something. You won't write something to the zero power. I'm just illustrating the pattern right here. These are both ones, so they don't matter. So it's really just C to the fourth 
plus 4c cubed d. Again, don't write something to the first power. I'm just doing that to illustrate the pattern. Plus 6c squared d squared, 4c d cubed. And then on the end, the very last term is a 1. Don't need to write that. c to the 0, that's 1. Don't need to write that. So just d to the fourth. So how do you actually raise something plus something to a power? You cannot just do c to the fourth plus d to the fourth, right? You kill a puppy. You have to do this long way, unless you want to write this out times itself four times, which most kids don't, right? So once they learn that there is this trick here and they get good at it, then that's like their best friend. And I think I do like Pascal's triangle too for that very same reason. All right, let's try one that's slightly more difficult. I want you to see that this is a little different, right? This one down, 2c minus 6d. It's got numbers and variables. It's no good. This is something people classically will mess up right from the get-go. This one's just, just like the last problem. It's like race to the fourth power again, right? It should basically be the same procedure, and it is. It's not going to be any harder. But this one's a little different and trickier because what? There's not just letters. There's like a two letter, two C, right? And there's a negative sign too, isn't there? There's a minus sign. Okay, so here we go. Ready? We're the same thing though. Raise the fourth power, correct? Go down to the fourth row, which is the same thing we just did, right? One, four, six, four, one. And you start writing it one times. Now, what's the first thing here? The first thing is 2C, correct? Not just the C, but the two also. This is the thing kids mess up. It's going to be raised. I assume we have this one start high up at four. Fair, okay. Don't write this. What's that mean? It means just the C was raised to the fourth. Yep. Make sure you put the things in parentheses. If you have a whole thing like 2c raised to the fourth, you got to write the whole expression 2c raised to the fourth, which is a problem in itself. What is 2c times itself four times? And then the other one, which was 6d, but not just 6d, but it also had a negative, correct? So the other thing, which was negative 6d, is raised to the smallest power, which is zero, right? So there's my first step. Note the parentheses. Not, I'm not doing anything different besides I put parentheses on it, correct? Let's see around this one. See around this. All right, next thing with four. Same thing we've been doing. We did the one, right? Now we're on to the four, so plus four. And then the 2c, that whole thing is raised to the third power. And the negative 6d is now raised to the first power. It's the same thing. Just using parentheses, because got to be careful about that. And you keep going. Next thing would be a six, right? Then the 2c would be raised to the second. And the negative 6d would be raised to the second. Where are we at now? What's the next number coming up? Anybody see it? Four again. Yep. We're right here. Four. So plus four. Now the 2c is raised to the first. The negative 6d is raised to the third. And lastly, we got a one again, right? And the 2c has gone down to the lowest spot of zero, and the negative 6d has gone to the highest spot of four. This one's hard. Okay, making sure you take a look at it. Notice we got parentheses. You notice we include the signs too, right? Negatives, right? So that's all tricky. Get your calculators out. There's gonna be too much to do in your mind. It's gonna be probably too much to do in your mind at this point. And will some of these numbers get huge when you do it? The answer is yes. They're not always gonna turn out to be 10 and five or 20. When you have weird numbers in it, it's gonna get huge. So we really need to talk about how to simplify this thing. All right, here we go. I see, I see lots of things going on here. First off, something to the zero power. I've already harped on it. What's anything to the zero power, guys? One. So does this part even matter? Not really. Does this part matter? No, not really. But this matters, right? Two C to the fourth. Now, these are multiplied together, right? They're not time, so I don't need to do any triangle stuff. You can do them separately. You got to figure out what two to the fourth is and what C to the fourth is. Well, what's two to the fourth? That's why I ask you to get your calculator out. Type it in. Two to the fourth. What do you get? 16. Okay, so 2 to the 4th is 16, right? I dealt with the numbers. There's no other numbers. That was a 1, right? This whole thing didn't matter. We already said, right? And the only other thing is a C to the 4th. So it's 16 C to the 4th. Oddly enough, this starts off with 16 C to the 4th. So when you have numbers in this thing, it's not always going to start off with a 1, 3. It's not always going to be like the numbers will jack it up, but the pattern's still the same. 
Okay, next one. Oh, oh boy, okay, now here's the tricky stuff. Let's go nice and slow, okay? Signs, numbers, and variables. It's kind of what you didn't think about, signs, numbers. Uh, this is a negative, correct? But it's raised to the first power. What's a negative raised to an odd power? Is it negative or positive? I don't know. Let's see. Well, what's anything to the first power? It's just itself, right? One's odd, right? Negative one to an odd power is still negative. Um, what's a negative squared, though? You should know what a negative squared is. What's a negative squared? Negative times a negative? Positive, right. So when things are, when negatives are raised, in fact, it sounds like we need a little note on that one. Negatives raised to odd powers are still negative. Negatives raised to even powers are positive. It's a good thing to know for life right there. So if you had negative raised to the fifth power, it'd be negative, right? Five's odd, right? Negative raised to the 99th power, 99's odd, negative. And negative raised to the millionth power, millions even, that would be positive right there. So keep that in mind going forward in life. So back to the problem now. Here's a negative raised to an odd power, right? So what is that, positive or negative? Negative, right? So I'm going to write minus this time because that's a negative, right? So I took care of the signs. Now I got a bunch of numbers floating around too. I see a four, I see a two cubed, right? And I see a six to the first. Everybody see where those numbers are? Okay, so we're going to type that in our calculator. Four times two cubed, two raised to the third power times the six. And you should get 192. You get 192? Okay. So it's minus 192 is the next number. What about variables? Well, that was a C cubed, right? And that's a D to the first, right? So I'm just going to write C cubed times D to the first or C cubed D. Cleaning it up is probably going to take a lot more time than actually writing down the triangle in the first place. I'm like, what's going on? All right, next term to clean. This one right here, first things first. I have a negative, right? It's raised to an even power. So what kind of number are you going to get out, positive or negative? Positive, right? This time it's positive. Negative raised to an even power according to the little cheat is positive. So I'm going to write positive plus, and I got a bunch of numbers to deal with again. I got a 6. I got a 2 squared, right? I also see a 6 squared. Do you see all those things? I see those. 6, 2 squared, and 6 squared. So type that in. 6 times 2 squared times 6 squared. And that's a big number. It's 864, according to my calculator. And then the variables involved is there's still a C squared, right? And a D squared. So I write C squared, D squared. And we just keep on going with this thing. Next one. This one right here we're dealing with. I see a negative raised to an odd power. What's a negative raised to an odd? It's a negative, right? So I'm going to write a minus sign, first off. Got a bunch of numbers floating around. I got a four a two to the first and a six to the third. So type that in your calculator. Four times two to the first times six to the third. It's gonna be a big number, I'm sure. It's huge. I'm getting 1,728, you getting that? It's huge. All right, we write it down. It is what it is. And as far as the variables go, this one had a C to the first or just C, right? And a D to the third. So I'm gonna write C, D to the and then the very last term here, here we go. This one, okay, I got a one. Do I need to worry about the one? Not really. Again, something to the zero. Anything to the zero is just one. So that doesn't matter either. All I got left is this thing right here. Well, it's a negative to an even power. What's a negative to an even power? It's positive. And I got a six to the fourth. So I got to figure out what six to the fourth is. It's probably a big number again. 1296, right? And then I also have this D to the fourth still chilling here. So do you get the gist? Do you see the pattern of what we're doing? It's a pain in the butt, though, to clean up. Would you agree? I think so, too. So let's try to squeeze one more in real quick, and then we'll see what can happen um, after that. All right. Here we go. Last one for the day. You want to make up something with fractions, because there's a couple things on your homework with fractions, but we'll keep it small. We'll keep it real small. 
How about last example? Mm, 4x plus 1 half squared. I'll, I'll go easy on you for the last one. 4x plus 1 half squared. Well, it's squared. So I'm looking for row two. Goes out. There's row two. So we're going to be easy. There's just three things to write down, right? One, two, and one. So here we go. We're going to do so it equals one, right? Always start with one. Which one do you want to start high? Which one do you want to start low? Probably this one's high. I'm going to have this be high. Okay. So what's the highest I can get up to? Two, right? Whatever the exponent is. So don't forget to put parentheses. That whole thing is raised to the second power. Cool. What about the half? What power is it raised to? Zero. Yeah. So half to the zero. I'll clean it up later. Don't try to clean as you go. Just write down the triangle right now, the pattern. We'll come back and we'll figure out exponents are and all that stuff. What number comes next? This is to the second power. So two, right? So plus two. Now the four X is raised to the first and the half has come down. Excuse me, the two came down to a one and the zero went up to a one. They just switched roles. Both raised to the first now. And lastly, you got a one again, right? So one times, and now the four X is raised to the zero and the half is raised to the second. So you gotta do some fractional work. That's the only reason I'm throwing this in here. Let's see what we can clean this up to. First one, any of the zero power, don't care, right? Zero power, got a one too, I don't care about that. But I do have a four X squared, right? Okay, well, what's four X squared? It's four X times four X, which is 16 X squared, right? Or you can just do four squared first, which is 16, right? And x squared. No matter how you slice it, you're gonna get 16 x squared. On the next one. Okay, it's got fractions. Let's see if we can do it though. I see a two times a four. Do you, they're all to the first power, right? I don't really care. Two times four is what? Eight. What's eight times a half? Four, right? Okay, so I got a four. And uh, the only thing left is an x. The only variable is an x to the first, right? So just four x. And lastly, on the last one, we have one doesn't matter, right? Something to the zero doesn't matter, right? What's a half squared? Anybody know what a half times a half is? Half times a half? No, no. Fourth, yeah, multiply straight across. So plus one fourth, and we're all done with that. So there's Pascal's triangle, binomial theorem, how you're gonna expand out any binomial. Binomial just means two things, right? That's what we've been doing on. Here's the thing, here's the thing, here's a binomial. So anything raised to a power, you got to go use this thing. Get the gist of it? Okay, it's tricky though. So that's your homework. You got it due on Wednesday. So all the time tomorrow to work, but I would get it started tonight because it does take some time to simplify things and clean them up and don't all kind of crap. All right, don't forget the 4.4 is due today. And of course, 4.5 for Wednesday. I'm out.